Hi, welcome to Perry Pierre podcast. I am your host, Perry Pierre. Uh, our next guest is Otto J. Abbott. He's a filmmaker and actor. Uh, his latest film, A New York Christmas Wedding, is now streaming on Netflix. So, sir, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me, Pierre. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you, you're the only son to two Nigerian parents, right? Um, tell me a little bit about your yes. upbringing in Queens. I know you were born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn too. Um, oh, but you grew go. up in Queens. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it's, it's, it's funny because as I'm getting older in life, I'm starting to realize more how important my upbringing has been. Mm -hmm. uh, my my family, my parents were immigrated from Nigeria to America. My dad came here for schooling to NYU. And my mother mm -hmm. came about three years after. They were high school sweethearts back in Nigeria. And mm -hmm. when they got to America, they had my sister and I. And it was interesting to know the fact that I grew up in a Nigerian household where mm -hmm. my parents, they, they brought the African culture to Queens and Brooklyn. But mm -hmm. when we went out to school and we had our friends we met in the neighborhood, they were all American. They were kept from different cultures. So mm -hmm. I feel of my perspective to life is very, very unique because I'm literally the first generation African American where my household was so different than what I was experiencing in the world. And I mm -hmm. came back to that every single night. So it wasn't a challenge in this per se where I lived some crazy life, but it was more mm -hmm. of a thing where reflective. I had to go back and feel, realize I know my upbringing with my parents and all my friends are saying, but what does that reflect to me and how I move, move forward in life? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Wow, that's a... Uh... Uh, that's very interesting. Um, and then afterwards, like you, you went to school in Queens again at St. John's University. Um, my cousin went to St. John's too. You probably, you probably oh, yeah, she, uh, she graduated in like 2008. But, um, you know, at St. John's, you played college basketball, Division One, And then you yep, also right. majored in communications and theater. Um, yep. did, you, did you try to make it uh, to the NBA at all? Or it was just I, like a, it, a college thing? Mm -hmm. it, it was for me, my main goal for sports was to really play at the highest level I could possibly play. And mm -hmm. back when I graduated St. John's, there was an opportunity to go overseas to play basketball there, so be it Dominican Republic, Europe, or whatever might be the case. But mm -hmm. I didn't have the passion and love for it as I did when I was younger. I, had, I was starting to develop more of a passion for the arts. And I had other mm -hmm. teammates who basically they knew all they knew was basketball. Mm -hmm. They didn't have another fallback plan that they wanted to pursue. And they had mm -hmm. to pursue a career in the unknown like any other artist may do. And mm -hmm. I'd rather pursue that career in the art rather than basketball for me. I want to put all the, my passion into making it happen as an actor rather mm -hmm. than making it happen as a basketball player. Because the NBA wasn't, wasn't guaranteed, as we all mm -hmm. know, because of the idea of international players. Right. But I mm -hmm. think now, because of the fact that I knew art is what I wanted to explore and experience, at the young age of graduating college, I knew I wanted to focus on that primarily. Okay, okay, okay. But, but do you do you watch the NBA though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely watch the NBA. I'm a diehard New York, New York Knicks fan, so you know. <laughs> me too. Me that. too. Yeah, yeah. It's I know it's it's been, it's, been, it's been disappointing, you know, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's also funny because my production company, Wilfo Productions, mm -hmm. that we started after my first short film, uh, we have a we have a pilot based about the idea of what happens you don't make it to the NBA, mm -hmm. and your whole life you've been told. You're gonna make, you're gonna make, you're gonna make it. Don't worry about school, don't worry about money that you borrow from people. You're gonna make mm -hmm. the NBA and then from there you'll be a star. What happens right. if you don't make it? So yeah. basketball has always been like um, a personal story to me because there are people that have that that dream of making mm -hmm. it to the NBA. But the reality mm -hmm. is like when you don't make it, what yeah. happens then? You start your life over at 25 years old rather than being coddled since you were 16. So exactly. I say that because there's so many great basketball type of stories. I'll make, make it to the NBA because you want to make a lot of money. You want to have a lot of girls. You want to have big houses. You want to have all this, have all that. But that's mm -hmm. like a 4% chance in the reality of the world. But 96% yeah. of other people don't make it. So where's their story? And I, and I say that because as much as I love basketball, I also love the idea of the reality behind people that are pursuing a dream and doesn't come to fruition. Yeah, yeah, I think there was a campaign um, with like a bunch of NBA players. They were talking about the fact that, you know, the percentage like of making it in the NBA is very uh, slim. So that's why they're yes. like, hey, you know, you can make it still as, a, as an engineer or as a doctor or as, you know, other, or in other fields, yep. Um, yep. to be exact. But um, uh, actually, one question, LeBron or Michael Jordan before I moved <laughs> away from that? Uh I, I grew up in the Michael Jordan era, but I grew up as an Knicks fan. You know, you know, Patrick Ewing, Anthony Mason, Anthony Mason. 
Mm -hmm. So you kind of don't have the love for Jordan. I respect him. But I think right now, if I could say either or, mm -hmm. I definitely have to say uh, LeBron. Yeah, LeBron. Okay. Well, what he's doing, what he's doing at a high level and consistent. It's a different era, of course, but mm -hmm. we're in the era of LeBron. So let's keep going with him and keep rooting him on. Got you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, so How about yourself? Man, <laughs> I have I have this argument with my friends all the time. I think I think I'd still probably go with Jordan just because yeah. you know he's he's won more titles and you know even though he's only been to six NBA finals, but he's won all of them. However, I really appreciate everything else that LeBron has done. You know, yep. for his community, like opening up the school and setting up for Black Lives Matter and all of these yep. things are just like simply amazing, you know. Yep. But I think probably I would still lean a little bit towards joining when it comes to the, the, the game itself. Um, yeah, so that's that, that's where I stand. Um, so so when you were in college and, you, you know, you said like, you know, you, you wanted to focus on other things uh, as well. But why theater? When did you uh, when did you know that was it for you that you wanted to be to to study theater and to perform as an actor and stuff like that? Yeah, so growing up, I, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, and I went to um, <clears throat> a junior high school. I went to junior high school public school all within. Uh, my goal was, at even at eight years old, to go to a, all my schools in a five-mile radius because I thought, one day I'm going to become something, so when they have an interview about me, we can walk around in five miles see where I went. So mm -hmm. I went to a junior high school, a public school, my high school, Archbishop Malloy High School, and St. John's, all within a five-mile radius. But after after high school... I went to a prep school for one year called The Gunnery, where mm. for me, that was one of the better experiences of my life that I got to experience and find my love for the arts there. And over mm -hmm. there at a prep school, they, they, they are more open to encouraging artists. I'm not saying mm -hmm. New York City was not, but New York City, if you don't have money, you go out to the streets, you play basketball, or you play mm -hmm. sports, or maybe you mm -hmm. may go to a mall, you know, if right, you right. city. But <laughs> yeah. out there, they're really, they really set up the idea where if you want to become a theater person, we have electives for you. So out there, I auditioned for my first play ever, William William Minge's Picnic at the Gunnery, and I got the lead role. And I was I wasn't surprised I got the lead role, but I was stunned knowing the fact that, wow, maybe I do have something in me if I'm given the opportunity. So we rehearsed this play for about two months. Then after after you know typical high school production, you have only three performances after like sixty days of work. Mm -hmm. So we had three performances, and the final performance. I remember having a curtain call and everyone's applauding. They enjoyed the show. And I realized after all that hard work, this is the final show after three performances. Is that it? I wanted so mm -hmm. much more. And right then and there, I knew I had the acting bug. And that was my, my, my first kind of realization that this is what I, this is what I want to do for, for the rest of my life. Okay. Wow. Uh, that's fascinating. Uh, but what about your parents? Because I know your parents are Nigerian. Like, how, yeah. do, how do they, uh, they feel about you majoring in theater? Well, my, my, my mother, my mother, she's been very supportive because of the fact that she always knew I used to be the young kid just watching a lot of films and TV and just wanting to, I was very vocal about it. And my mm -hmm. father, he was supportive, but he also was someone who he came to America, you know, to, he came to America for education, went to NYU, went to St. John's for his business degree, started working, not, started working his way up <clears throat> different companies. Mm -hmm. But then he left those companies to start his own company. And I think my pursuing the arts is similar to his, where he realized I wanted to do my own thing rather than follow someone else. Mm -hmm. So he really understood that idea by being your own business person. So he was very respectful of that. And my mm -hmm. mother's happy. My mother just doesn't want me to struggle. You know, she saw mm -hmm. it early on when I graduated the struggle of where are you going to find your next meal? Not in the sense of yeah. she'll feed me, of course. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Where, 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 if, if I'm not, I'm a, I'm a very, since I'm a very modest person. So if I'm out from outside, I'm the type of person I'd rather have one meal and use that last bit of money I have to look to pay for like a magazine to look for additions, which is not the right thing to do. But at that mm -hmm. point in time, I just wanted it so badly. And my mother knew that. So she, she cared, she, she worried about me for that type of case. But in the mm -hmm. end, she's very happy to see the incremental progress in my career. And more than anything with this feature film, she's very happy because this is a film that she would watch. Mm -hmm. if she came upon it herself rather than be her son's film. So she's very happy with this. Yeah, no, that, uh, absolutely. Um, so, so after college, you 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 got you got your agent, right? Was it was it like an acting agent or was it like a like a how do you call it a literary literary agent? Literary, yeah. So I I right now I don't have a literary agent. I'm still in the works with that. And I I mean to be honest, I find it very surprising because mm -hmm. I'm the kind like I said before, I'm I'm an athlete. I'll do the work to kind of get whatever I need to get. But there's some people who come from different classes that if yeah. they 
know the right people, they get it right away. And you know, you know, you know, yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I have, I have, I have pretty decent connections in the sense of what I need for my life. But mm-hmm. I also feel as a while, the connections are good, but in the end, there's talent. And I feel like mm-hmm. with this film and my other past works, I'm just playing talent where the right agent, when they see that literary agent, they'll definitely come on board. But other than that, I have a manager right now with Elixir Entertainment. He's a manager for literary and also uh, talent. So he's my guy, Mm -hmm. um, Nick. And we're we're finding projects, we're finding things to do. But when Mm -hmm. I got out of uh, college, my first first agent was a commercial agent. And that Mm -hmm. was through um, the actor Jim Gaffigan, who was, Mm -hmm. you know, the very amazing comedian, hot pocket, legendary guy. And he basically, was saying, you know, you are a very commercial looking person. You speak well, you know how to act. I can refer you to someone. And that's how it happens early on. But then after a while, you have to show that you have talent. So right. that's still, we're working on that. And I think there's no better way to display talent than having a film that's a popular film on Netflix as a writer, director, producer, actor. Yeah, no, exactly. And we, you know, we're going to talk a, a little bit more about it. Um, but um, your first short was was Jitters. I, I, I was just watching a video, actually, you said that, uh, um, doing an interview, I think, uh, at a film festival. And yeah. during that time, you said that uh, you have a feature film, but nobody wanted to invest in the feature film because you didn't have anything to show. Was the, that feature film that you're talking about uh, a New York Christmas wedding? Oh, that's a great question. It wasn't that. My, my mm-hmm. first feature film that I wrote, I wanted to, I was very inspired by, again, our generation, Yelena Dunham's. So Lena mm-hmm. Dunham had her, you know, she did a lot of film before at her school. But she did her first feature, Tiny Furniture, did very well, went to festivals. And because of that, mm-hmm. she's on HBO as the youngest executive ever on HBO with yeah. girls. And yeah. I was very inspired by that. I said, oh, okay, the best way to do it is you have a feature film, you display your talent, and then from there, the networks, the networks will come calling. So mm-hmm. I wrote a feature film and I wanted to do it. I wrote it for a, a low budget and <laughs> networks are not coming calling. And I have people told me, you have to show what you can do first before they come calling to you. Because again, I'm an actor turned director writer. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, let me, write a, let me write a short film about something that's personal to me and something I can explore. And I thought with Jitters, it's a perfect way to highlight myself as an actor, a writer, director. And more importantly, I was highlighting myself as a producer because we got it done. And because right. of Jitters, we had local Productions, our production company. So that first feature, I still have, and I want to get it done. But then when Jitters was made, people loved that, loved the universal idea of it. And then because of that, a production company, Conglomerate Media, and their producer, Corey Appen, saw Jitters, loved it, and said, can you make this into a feature film for us? Because we want the same type of idea, Christmas, Mm -hmm. a wedding, a church in New York, and a same-sex marriage, but we want it for a feature film. Mm -hmm. And I try to explore Jitters into that type of narrative, but... The best thing about a short film is that it's so contained. And the, mm-hmm. once you start adding different things to it, it doesn't really work. It's not as strong as it's supposed to be. So I, I don't want to mess with jitters because jitters is still something that I want to explore and broaden, but not for mm-hmm. a feature film at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So I kept the same themes and tones and added different type of characters. And I said, if I can't have the same characters for jitters, mm-hmm. but the same idea, how can mm-hmm. I explore this in a feature film? And then that's how a New York Christmas Chris wedding came about. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I think um I think you know it's, it's a lot of like interesting things in uh in both movies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean so that's a nice segue into like a New York Christmas wedding. Um you know, first of all, let me just say rest in peace to Chris uh Trisdale, Trisdale. Yeah. 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 Um I was I was reading that um he passed away in June from uh coronavirus. Yeah. Um wow, yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's 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 so um not it's surprising because mm-hmm. he's someone who Again, he came on board as an actor. He also was, we were looking to have some, some of his music in the film. Mm-hmm. And his music that he was, he, he put out there wasn't as, not, what, it wasn't, it was the same tone for the film. But mm-hmm. he had a beautiful song of Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. We were going to add it to the film, but the problem is he started going with rights and, you know, public domain and things like that. So we couldn't use that song. Mm-hmm. And we were at a level where we, we were going, going, going. We couldn't really wait. But I wish his music was in the film because it's so beautiful. But to have his face and to have his, as a wedding reception, as a wedding, as a piano singer, to have him in the film and his energy. And I feel like he's our angel guiding us down right now to get the film to more eyes. So I feel like it's, it's, it's such a troublesome thing, but it's also great to have his final screen performance be with us. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so it, is Christmas your favorite holiday? 
Uh, <laughs> I would say, yeah, I, I, I enjoy Christmas, Christmas a lot. I like Christmas. I like Valentine's Day. <laughs> no, <Not> Valentine's <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's like uh, I like Valentine's yeah. Day. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, Christmas is definitely my favorite holiday. I grew up watching Christmas films with my mother, decorating the house with my mother, and it's something where I really, it's something that it's, just, it's a warm feeling for everyone. And I think no matter what, mm -hmm. I started seeing the idea, the business behind Christmas, Mm -hmm. a couple of years ago but before then i was totally all into the i to the spirit of christmas mm -hmm. so um it was to write again to write a christmas film i never thought i could write one myself but mm -hmm. i also thought because a lot of christmas films deal with things that you and i come coming up in new york city we don't see our stories in these christmas films at all we see yeah. other people's stories we kind of relate to it because they're available to us mm -hmm. but i knew with this and the christmas story that i want to see i had to explore it from my perspective and that's why, more than anything, I'm very proud of our film because we're showing Christmas in a way that we never really see it before. And for some people, that might be shocking to them, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. But for people like you and I, who come from a community, we're excited. We're excited yeah. for something new and different. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's true. Um, so as a writer, like, what was, what was the, your process like in completing the script? And then, you know, did you, did you write the story down first? Or, you know, did you have a breakdown? What was, your, um, what was the process like? Yeah, so Conglomerate Media, they gave me the four things to explore, to put in this film. And they only gave me four things. Like I said, they gave me Christmas, mm -hmm. New York City, a wedding mm -hmm. in a church, and a same-sex mm -hmm. couple. And because of that, I had to really, I had to really go back into my mind and see what really, what really works. And, mm -hmm. I knew, and I knew to have, what worked with Jitters is that people were very, very happy or surprised to see the normalization of a same-sex couple inside of a, inside a of a church they've never mm -hmm. seen that before mm -hmm. and people were emotional about that because they've seen this in a film but not in real life so you know and I, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to see like why can i not see this in real life mm -hmm. so when conglomerates said to do these things I, I thought about i can make something that's kind of false and kind of like hokey and it could be something like well you know we're having this wedding in the church it's so great it's so beautiful but that's not reality and I want to explore why it's not reality. And that's when the whole theme about the church came about because it's not real because the church is not standing by people having same-sex marriages. And I thought, okay, that's really a good thing to kind of explore aside from a love story because these are people that are in love and because they've been baptized in the church, they've been confirmed in the church, they have communion, but yet when they want to get married, I mean, these are people who feel welcome but not equal. And exploring that, I thought like there was something more deep, there was something deeper there that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the treatment down and our producer Corey Apton loved it. We worked on the story for about a month and a half, just kind of fleshing out these different types of parallels. Once you have an alternate world, something happens mm -hmm. in the A story, then it has to be a result in the B story. Right. And again, people kind of give me a hard time saying, you know, your first film ever that you're making, you're doing this <laughs> alternate world type of ambitious <laughs> story, but it's something I want to see. And even though low budget or not, we still got it done. I think I take really a lot of pride in that. So we got the script down in about three months. Mm. We had a couple of readings, got a lot of notes from people. And my main thing when I did the script to, and I asked friends and family, like, does this make sense? That's the one mm. thing you have to ask people when you're writing an alternate story, even any type of story, the first time filmmakers, like, mm -hmm. does this make sense? Because I know what it's like from my mind, and maybe my producers, I talk to her, but mm -hmm. to you as a layman viewer or reader, does it make sense? When mm -hmm. people started saying yes and got emotional towards it, I realized we're ready to go and go start filming. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how'd you get uh, Chris, Chris North on board? Yeah, so Chris North, is, uh, he's a really good friend of mine. He's been a mentor toward me since we, we, worked, we worked together on the Broadway play called That Championship Season in mm -hmm. 2011. And ever since mm -hmm. then, he, Kiefer Sutherland, Jim Gaffigan, Jason Patrick, and Brian Cox, they've been my big mm -hmm. brothers. And oh, okay. I've been a part of them. I've been a part of them in their careers for a while now. And I think as now I'm starting, starting to grow my career, they're doing all they can to make sure that I stay in the right lane. So they've been very, very supportive. And, and Chris actually was the executive producer of Jitters. So this project, mm -hmm. he wanted to come on board in this project. And then when I wrote this personal story about the priest and showing a character of conflict, Chris mm -hmm. liked the idea a lot and came on board to act on it. So mm -hmm. it's not something that he, he, won't, he won't do these films all the time, mm -hmm. but he also was aware that this is a story that you don't see before. And I think mm -hmm. with any independent film, you have to really, you have to do something that, that's, that's new, that's inventive. Yeah. That's, that's it has to be unique, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we've seen, we've seen them all the time. And if, you're, if your film is showing something that's been done already by Hollywood, 
Why yeah. would they want to see it? Because we've done it already at a, at a hot, bigger budget, more more type of glass, better more known cast sometimes. Yeah, yeah. we did we done everything at that level. So you want you want to remake something like that at a lower level? You can't. You have to be innovative. Mm-hmm. And I think more than anything, and I think people are realizing is that we're innovative. We have we we we're we're right now we're one of six LGBTQ plus holiday stories coming out, and we're mm-hmm. six of them, and we're the only one with a, a diverse cast, and that mm-hmm. says a lot. You know, yeah. we went to studios to kind of produce this film and get financing for it, and they wouldn't do it because I was the first time writer director, and I understand that. Mm-hmm. But in the end, we didn't wait. Conglomerate Media said we 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 invest in you. We're gonna put money behind this and tell the story now, rather than waiting for five years from now when Hollywood finally realizes we could do this. And if they do realize that, they'll kick me to the curb and then they'll do it with someone else. So we decided to do it right now, and we're very happy that in our push, mm-hmm. Netflix saw the ambition and they they stood by us. Okay, um, so so Netflix, how how did the Netflix find out about it? Like, was it through like a film festival? So we went through. We went to you know again. Now we're in 2020, where the virtual film festival is is a thing now. Before mm-hmm. you'll be at film festivals, red carpets, press, everything, yeah. schmoozing with um distributors and and uh, sales agents. But we went to some pretty good festivals, but they're they're mainly black centric. So we went to Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival, Urban mm-hmm. World Film Festival, mm-hmm. Neo Latino Film Festival. Um, uh, Black Black Alphabet Film Festival and mm-hmm. Tall Grass Film Festival. We went to a lot of different festivals and American Black Film Festival where we premiered. And these film festivals, they have a following. And when you hit these film festivals, they know that your film is not just this. It proves the audience for your film. And mm-hmm. I want to commend all those film festivals because they they stood by a, a genre specific holiday film for an independent film festival. Usually, film mm-hmm. festivals they don't want to go that route because they want to be more indie. Yeah. But I think those film festivals that found us to realize we haven't seen something like this before and let's give this a platform because mm-hmm. there should be more of these films, but we, ha- we have to stand by them. And mm-hmm. these festivals did. And from there, we got distribution through a company called Mar Vista Entertainment. Our producer, Corey Apton, knew someone at Mar Vista. They saw the film, they liked it, they personalized with it. And from there, they said, you know, we'll take a place and then we'll hopefully get it sold. And they got mm-hmm. to Netflix and Netflix saw the film. They liked it. And I also think Netflix, to what my point before, they don't have a film like this. So Netflix, no. yeah. Netflix in a way, they could, be, they could be innovative, saying that we'll be the first one to kind of stand by a film, of our first diverse queer holiday film. So, you know, I, I kind of joke around with friends and family that we're the vanguard. We're the vanguard film. And <laughs> yeah. who knows, years from, years from now, maybe something will be different. But we did it first. And I think more than anything, that's prideful for Wolf of Productions, Conglomerate, and all mm-hmm. friends and supporters of this film. Wow. Yeah, man, that's that's awesome, man. That's amazing. Other than obviously the fact that you try to pitch it to some studios in Hollywood and they said no, what are some other challenges that you that you had to overcome in order to make this film? I think the main challenge when you're dealing with a ultra low budget film is that you have to get people not that believe in you, because you have that the core group of people, but you have to get people that are involved knowing that Yes, there's not a lot of money here, but we're doing something that's very, very unique. So we had okay. a lot of first time, we had a lot of people working their first feature. It was, it was my first as a writer, director. It was Wolf of Productions, my company as a production company, their first feature. Mm-hmm. Our editor, Ian Phillips, his first feature film, Narrative. Our mm-hmm. DP, Ethan Madoff, his first feature, Narrative, mm-hmm. as a DP. So we had a lot of people that, you know, they, they took the opportunity and ran with it rather than, and I always said, because I'm a team guy, I always said mm-hmm. my first short film, we did well, so let's keep the same team and grow together. And we definitely yeah. did grow together. So I think the challenge is basically getting people to realize that this team is all in and there's a core mm-hmm. group of people here that, you know, we, we're learning as we go, but we're still, we're still doing the art. And I think more than anything, it's trying to relay that message to people. Because people may knock the idea of our the low budget nature of a film, but in the end, it's still a film that's being made with the right intentions and executed in a way. So I think more than that's a major challenge. And getting and also money's a hard thing. Yeah, <laughs> you have to cut a lot of you know you have to cut a lot of sacrifices. You have to film at people's homes, friends' homes. You have to uh, have uh, your friends' parents cooking food. You know, you have to yeah, borrow sometimes people's for cars. the craft. <laughs> yeah, you have to borrow people's cars. You have to. You know, for, for about a month, my life my life, and my house was just upside down because it was a production studio, it was a film set, it was a place mm-hmm. where I slept in a corner just to get some rest for four hours before I go out and do it again. 
<laughs> yeah, man, but that you know, that's the that's what you gotta do uh, when you when you're a filmmaker and an indie filmmaker. But yeah. look at it right now, man. You know, it's 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 on Netflix and it's doing yeah. well. So I guess uh, it uh, the the hard work paid off. Um, yeah. How Thank how did they react? Like the team, like when they found out that you sold the film to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that that was a great day for the team because we always felt that Lifetime would have been great, but we knew. And ironically, when we were in post-production, Lifetime, they they took away a commercial for a same-sex couple kissing. Hallmark, I'm sorry, not Lifetime. Hallmark took away a same-sex couple kissing yeah. for a commercial. And we realized, wow, this film is definitely something that Lifetime needs, Hallmark needs. We have something that people need. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, I mean, I thought if we get to Hallmark, or I, if we get to Hallmark, that will be a great opportunity because Hallmark could say, oh, you thought we did this last year, but here's our new film. Right. But then I realized we're the first like TV movie that has the F word in it, so we can't really go to Hallmark and the religion <laughs> aspect of our film and you know the um, the uh, toned down love making scene in our film. Hallmark people will get very up in arms, so that wasn't the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But then when to find out when Netflix was when Netflix acquired the film, we were just thrilled over the moon, and it's more it's it's funny because more people are. More people are excited about that than the film festivals. And I mm -hmm. get why, because friends know about Netflix rather than film festivals. Oh, as yeah. An indie, <laughs> as an indie filmmaker, I'm like, we were in these big film festivals. Are, are you happy about that? Like, yeah, I know. But Netflix. <laughs> you know? I know. You know what's crazy? I think it's more like for filmmakers. Like, if you're a filmmaker and you tell someone, oh, I got accepted into Hampton Film Festival, yeah, they're like, yeah. oh, they know what it is. But yeah. if you tell like a family member, I got accepted into Hampton, they're like, oh, that, that's nice. But if you tell them, <laughs> man, the film's yeah. going to be on Netflix. Like, ah! yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so every, everyone was very excited because it just proved that all the hard work we've done the past year is at the mm -hmm. highest level right now. To be honest, there's no theaters. If they're in it, so without any theaters, mm -hmm. yeah, HBO would be great. I mean, I love HBO, but HBO is a, is a, HBO is a place where not many people have subscriptions to it. Mm -hmm. But Netflix, I mean, if you're, if you're any type of living human being in this world right now, you have Netflix or you could borrow oh, someone, someone account, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, oh wow, that's awesome. What are, What are some of the feedback that you've gotten from um, people who've watched the film? Not necessarily family members or or friends. Like you know, other people who reach out to you. Yeah. So it, it's it's people who reach out to me. It's really great to the feedback I'm getting because they're loving the film. They're loving the uh, specific storytelling because they're seeing themselves in it. I have a lot of people who message me privately just to mention the fact that they grew up in a household where they had to curb curb the idea of who they love out to their parents or even growing up in a church where they felt they didn't feel they were equal to the church. So they were very happy to see, finally, I'm seen in a way where I could watch a film and kind of relate to the character more so than just the character being someone who's in love. So they mm -hmm. love that. Then on the flip side, when you start going through a rabbit hole, you start like typing in the film's name on Twitter and things like that. You start seeing people talk about things where you know, you shouldn't really see it, but it's good to kind of see people's opinions. A lot of mm -hmm. people mention the fact that it's a low budget film, which I feel as if they have every right to say that, but I think they're comparing our film to million dollar productions, which, you know, mm -hmm. they have every right to do that, but that's not us, you know? Yeah, we, yeah. You know, and, but, but it happens, you know, and I think it was the other day, we're getting a lot, a lot of press now, and the other day, BET, they had their top 13 films for the fall and winter holiday films, Mm -hmm. I did not even holiday from just just films, and we were I believe we were number ten, I think, or eleven, and they mm -hmm. had films by produced by studios. You had Amazon, you had Paramount, you had Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. you had Disney, you had Netflix, you had um, you had a uh, Hulu, and we're the only film that was independently made. So these films are all made for millions of dollars, and our film is not made for that. But yeah, mm -hmm. we're still on that list because one, we're innovative, we're unique, and two, we're showing the story that people need to see. Mm -hmm. So other than that, you know, I, I try to look at all the messages and all the comments and feedback because, again, I'm an athlete. I have pretty thick skin and I like to, you know, if I, I used to play sports, if I make like a spin move, dribble, dunk, <laughs> and I miss it, my coach yeah. would say, you did this wrong, do this better, and I'll do it better. <laughs> so right. people are giving me feedback about the film and, you know, I'm very open to it. But it's very interesting because we have like that split side of things. Either you love it or you don't like it, but you don't like it because you're expecting something that's not this. Mm -hmm. There's one there's one person I felt the film was they felt to be more of a hetero story, which I think it could be whatever you want it to be. It's a love story. It's about it's how a love you perceive, story, yeah. yeah, it's about how you perceive the world. If you if you're mad because there's two women falling in love, then that's more on you 
you hate our film for that reason, sure, that's great, you can do that, but it's more of a love story. And I think more than anything, people are kind of realize the universe, the universal aspect of the film in that way. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, I read a quote, you said that the, the film is about love, plain and simple, you know, and I yeah. agree, man. Um, wow. Uh, so, so what was the process like in like post editing? Was it, was it in post actually that you, 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 you decided that you were gonna kind of like play with the timeline of the film mm -hmm. a little bit or was that already written? Well, it was already written, definitely, to play with the timeline. And mm -hmm. luckily, I, I come from theater, as we discussed. And so whatever's on, whatever's on the page, mm -hmm. this is what it is. We can't, okay. really, <laughs> we can't really change things. And I think that's to, to our benefit is that we followed, the, we, we knew what we were going into the film. It wasn't mm -hmm. just that we just filmed everything and just switched it up at the last minute. Because films have done that. I've been a part of a film where we filmed everything in one way and then because of the idea of it not blowing up performances they switched up the idea of like flashbacks and things like that mm -hmm. and i learned from like i learned from one of my good friends and mentors he, he told me that flashbacks are cheats so you really <laughs> have to try not to use flashbacks a lot flashbacks and voiceovers sometimes they're, they're needed and they're useful especially they voiceovers <laughs> yeah it's so hard because they, they are they are cheating in filmmaking because and if you think about that and this is for the filmmaker people out there it's it's so hard to tell a straight story, straight meaning like a narrative, mm -hmm. and having it just be the story a two hour committed story. Mm -hmm. We use flashbacks because we want to we want to advance the story in a way, but really try mm -hmm. to challenge yourself by not using a flashback or a voiceover. Mm -hmm. When you, and you could do it obviously, but don't don't fall back to that every single time because it's so mm -hmm. easy to do that, and we have to really try to be creative as storytellers. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we we just made the film and we we wanted it to be exactly what was on paper and in post. We realized we realized there are some problems. No, no. We realized that there are some things that are redundant. So I had mm -hmm. I had we have like two deleted scenes. We have one mm -hmm. scene before we meet Asriel on the bike. He's mm -hmm. in a bar talking to um, a woman, and a woman's kind of calling him out for being a flamboyant character. And mm -hmm. and, and it's a really good scene. And our editor and producer Ian Phillips, he was saying we can't use this. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what? We spend a whole day filming this. He's like, well, <laughs> we can't use it because. It's stronger to see Azrael, the character, introduced exactly. by the bike accident rather than some random guy talking to a girl in a bar. We have no idea where this is going. You know. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's I think it's 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 more important that that we the audience we meet we meet uh, 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 Israel's the character like at the same time that she's yeah. meeting the character. Yeah. yeah, correct, correct. So you see that that's that's the main thing. Where on paper, on paper, I thought it was a fun scene. It works. It's like light. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's interesting and it's, it shows. It shows Cooper, who's a phenomenal actor. It shows him play with the stereotypes that I'm saying before about people who want to see a hetero story. They're 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 labeling him as someone. Oh, you talk you talk like this, then you are you are this person. It's like you just call me that, but I'm still a person. So mm -hmm. We kind of like we kind of were too on the nose about that. So it's a deleted scene. It's a great scene, and we'll probably release that sometime in the future. But you know, mm -hmm. it's, that's how you do in editing. You start forming the story in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think also to your point, when Jennifer wakes up after the alternate reality and she tells David, let me mm -hmm. take you to Queens. And they go to Queens and then they go to the church. Mm -hmm. Before they went to the church, we had the scene where, and we filmed it, where Jennifer goes to her old childhood home mm -hmm. and she goes there to see if her father's there. And then an Asian woman answers the door mm -hmm. and she's kind of confused, like, what do you want? And Jennifer's like, well, I, I used to live here. This is my fiance. You might have to come inside. And they're like, no, 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 wait, wait, what? You can come inside, you can't come inside this house. You don't <laughs> yeah. live here anymore. Mm -hmm. And I like that scene because it just shows that Jennifer's a spiraling. But our editor, producer Ian, said, he's saying there's no reason to go to that house because when she wakes up, it's like, what about Gabby right away? You don't want to go mm -hmm. divert it to her house and things like that. It's not about this. It's about Gabby to love. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 her focus. It's almost like she needed like kind of like confirmation. Yeah. But um, wow, man, that's that's amazing. Did you guys use Premiere to edit? Yeah, we, we did Adobe Premiere. That's what we did at uh, Jitters. And it's, it's, um, it's <laughs> again, an ultra low budget film. It's hard because, you know, the mm -hmm. money runs out. People work for free, but people are still committed to see it to the yeah. end. And that's why I think having like a Netflix type of um, premiere, it reminds people that all their hard work wasn't for nothing. But, you know, it's, it, it was definitely a difficult thing, like sending the film out to this place and that place, getting it back. And it was, it's, it's easy to work in a post house and just have everyone do it at one point of time. But mm -hmm. for ultra low budget films, people are working on the film, they're working on their day jobs, coming back home, you're sleeping, being mm -hmm. with your relationships. It's just a lot, but we got it done. 
Yeah, no, no, you did, man. You did a great job. Um, what can people see you in next? Or what, what are other films that are like on the horizon that you're kind of currently working on um, that people can see? Um, yeah, so this past, this past year has been all about this film, man, because of the, uh, COVID. the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because of the pandemic, it's a little bit, it's not difficult, it's, it's difficult where the opportunities as an actor are, aren't, and productions are, aren't as forthcoming because of the idea of COVID nature. But I'm still auditioning for things, but also our production company, Willful Productions, right now we're going to market with our slate. We have a slate of uh, feature films, TV series, we have a web series, and we have documentaries. Mm -hmm. And um, so right now we're working on that. So writing stuff and just go taking meetings because we have a story to be told. Like this is our mm -hmm. first feature film. We have a mm -hmm. short film, but they both have been acquired by two top streaming platforms, Amazon and Netflix. So we have content. Now it's about getting the right people to see that. And then from there, explore more stories. And ironically, mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, and I'm really proud of this, about a month ago, the artist Queen V asked Wolf mm -hmm. Productions to produce and meet and have me direct her her, her uh, music video called Strong, which is available on YouTube. And it's my first music video I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And I'm the kind of person that I'm asked to do something. And I say yes when I do it. And I get better when I do it. So mm -hmm. it was great to kind of do that music video. It's out there. And I had a really good time. So we're doing more music videos, too. So we just want to keep on working at Wolf Productions and keep on creating more content. Yeah. Absolutely, man. I look forward to uh, to watching more of your content and congratulations again on the Thank film. Thank you so much, man. Um, you know, New York is my thing. Christmas is my favorite holiday and whatever. You know, I'm a lover boy. So when I saw that title, I was like, let me click on it right now. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. so yeah, man, I had a lot of uh, uh, fun watching it. So uh, Did you get emotional? The thing is, mm, no, I, I think I, maybe at the end, maybe I didn't like when, when she kind of like went back to yeah. to you know to to the yeah. other reality um but yeah yeah it was definitely touching though it was definitely yeah I, I i always had the idea where you know you want to say this film can be made for women who knows but i always had the idea where if you're with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whomever you might be with you and you sit down you watch a film because someone's saying watch this with you mm -hmm. and you're like oh whatever i don't want to watch this film fine <laughs> watching it <laughs> and then uh -huh. 20 minutes 20 minutes into it you're like oh, i like this babe i like this honey you know <laughs> i always wanted that to happen so it's like the idea where you don't you don't think you're gonna look like this film when you watch and you follow the story because mm -hmm. your partner's saying sit here and watch this <laughs> you'll enjoy it there's other there's other worse things out there yeah no actually i watched the film twice the first time was was with uh with my fiance and then the second time i watched it on my own for the purpose of this interview so that's when yeah. i'm like you know i sit down like i'm working and i watch the and i watch oh. it over <laughs> well so, thank you yeah absolutely so um thank, thanks a lot man uh thanks thanks again for this interview and uh thank you you know take care be safe out there and uh yeah